Well, hi, uh, I'm Andrew Brenner. I'm a consultant with Invest. Uh, and we wanna thank you for joining our event today. Our mission is to empower investors and entrepreneurs to build a sustainable future using capital markets. And hopefully this panel will, panel will help give you some insight in, in, into some strategies for how to do that. Uh, 2021 was another great year for sustainable finance. Green social sustainability and sustainability linked bond issuance uh, reached a combined $1 trillion for full year 2021. It's an estimate, could be a little more, could be a little less, but it's, it's still a major milestone. Uh, a record $700 billion flowed into ESG focused funds worldwide, which is a nearly 200% increase in just two years. We saw record high levels of shareholder activism with support for social and environmental proposals at the shareholder meetings of US companies rising to 32% in 2021. Uh, 50 years ago, that was 1%. <laughs> so basically something that was non-existent is now happening at a third of shareholder meetings. Uh, early estimates indicate impact specific investments approaching $1 trillion in assets under management for the first time. And 2022 figures to see these trends continue with sustainable investments continuing to reach new heights. Today, we wanted to bring together a panel of experts from both the investing and academic worlds to discuss 2022 trends, ways to meet future capital requirements and strategies for net zero investing, as well as a little bit of future looking discussion beyond 2022. Joining us for this discussion are Julia Wilkinson, the CEO of Invest and CRO of OBE Power, Kyle Berry, founder and managing partner of Mission One Capital, Chris Mattini, lead analyst on sustainable investments at TIFF Investment Management, and Dr. Bruce Hull, senior fellow at the Center for Leadership and Global Sustainability at Virginia Tech. I'd like to give each of our panelists a chance to introduce themselves to our audience, as well as one highlight from 2021 that really stood out for each of you. And let's start with Julia. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's so good to see some of your faces, familiar faces and new ones. We really appreciate you joining. Happy 2022. Hope it's been a good start for everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Julia Wilkinson. My background is in capital markets and sustainable finance for the past 15 years. I've worked on the private wealth management side, venture capital, private equity, and consulting with a variety of types of investors and entrepreneurs. Um, at Invest, we provide consulting and support on portfolio construction, diligence, impact measurement, and also accelerate early stage entrepreneurs in the space. Um, to, we focus on thematic impact investing. You might hear slightly different you know, descriptions of what is impact investing today. We focus on thematic impact invest, investing, which we define as intentionally investing towards measurable social or environmental outcomes that are positive <laughs> uh, based on evidence, real uh, evidence-based strategies. Um, I am also the, CR, the chief revenue officer of OB Power, uh, which is actually a startup that Invest accelerated originally. And we uh, I got very passionate about the mission of accelerating the transition to e-mobility which was, is one of, of course, the largest drivers of GHG emissions in the US. Transportation is 29% of GHG emissions in the US, not globally, but, but in our country. So uh, what stood out for me about investing in sustainable investing in 2021, um, the types of both fund managers out there that are popping up all kinds of niche, unique uh, managers of different types, not just in climate, but also diversity and inclusion, um, sustainable ag, regenerative economies, you're seeing a lot more types and also entrance from the traditional sector. So we're seeing uh, the big banks entering the space aggressively, you know, the asset managers like Carlisle, KKR, fund managers that have billions under management starting to integrate ESG and impact. So now it's easier than ever if, if we really try hard enough to build portfolios around these strategies that are diversified by asset class, by region, by geography, by uh, strategy. So, so it's getting easier by the minute to build a portfolio that's diversified, that can have big impact. Um, and one big sort of policy change that also is driving some new investors in the space or allowing them back into the space are uh, the Labor Department in 2021 allowed ERISA funds, which are like IRAs, 401ks to invest in ESG strategies again which represent $45 trillion of investment over the next several decades and is really patient capital, right? Aligned well to long-term outcomes uh, for a sustainable society. So exciting to see that shift again towards uh, a more inclusive ESG policy. Next. 
Excellent. Uh, Kyle, let's hear from you. How's everyone doing? Good evening. Um, it's a hard one to follow there already. It's going to be a great panel. Um, I'm Kyle Berry. I'm, um, like Andrew said, I'm the founder and managing partner of Mission One Capital. Um, and our focus is to um, invest into early stage startups that are solving for what we deem to be three existential threats. Um, one being climate change, the second one being resource depletion, and the third one being the inequality gap. Um, and so that's the focus of our fund. Um, my background um, has been in, I started my career in finance doing M&A in the US and in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I've worked in the startup space um, and also uh, on the entertainment side as well, where I got to run the venture capital firm for Lincoln Park, the rock band. Um, and so I've done venture um, on a global scale in pretty much every continent around the world in that regard. Um, and now I'm building Mission One focus on um, ESG and sustainability. And I look forward to meeting everyone. Um, oh, and the one thing you mentioned as well. So what am I excited about or what have I been excited about for 2021? I think really what's been exciting in 2021, like you mentioned, all the numbers, it's been a positive year for, for ESG and sustainability as a whole from an investment standpoint. But I think even specifically from a venture standpoint, like the small world of venture within the larger financial space, we're starting to see more and more proof points um, that we can see scalable, um, you know, viable businesses that are reaching, you know, unicorn status um, and not just in mobility, like the Rivians and the Teslas of the world, but we're even seeing it going across um, all types of different sectors as well that kind of encompass climate tech. Um, so, you know, things like appeal sciences and form energy, uh, redwood materials in the battery recycling space, um, insect in the kind of food, um, but mealworm space, which is really interesting as well. So we're starting to see a breadth more of, of climate companies. Um, there's still a concentration of capital and we'll talk about that, but I think I'm really excited to see a breadth of climate tech companies really show proof points um, at the kind of like billion plus mark as, as from a venture standpoint. Um, and that's really, you know, manifesting in us seeing 14 cents of every dollar um, from a venture standpoint going into climate, which is really, really exciting. So I think it's a great time in 2021, we'll just kind of continue that story. Awesome. Thank you. 14 cents on every dollar is, is great progress. Uh, let's pass it over to Chris and, and hear a little bit about you. Well, uh, I have not worked for a rock band, although it is an aspiration. Um, <laughs> My name is Chris Mattini. I work at TIFF Investment Management. We are an outsourced chief investment officer firm. We manage money for nonprofits of all kinds and have been doing so for 30 years. We apply, we allocate to managers of all sorts. So uh, long only public equity managers, hedge funds, fixed income, private funds of all sorts. We apply an ESG lens to all of that. We also have strategies that are dedicated to thematic sustainable investments and impact. And I we are research efforts around those investments. The one thing that was really big to me in 2021 was the amount of net zero commitments that were made globally from governments, companies, investors. Um, Oxford's net zero research in initiative says that 88% of emissions and 90% of GDP are now covered by net zero commitments. Now, obviously, a promise is easy to make, especially when we're talking about promises made about 2050. And the technology is not quite there yet. And data and measurement are still a challenge. And greenwashing will be real. And execution is going to be difficult. But what I think that means is that we're just early on. And I think it's actually a good thing for all of us on the phone because we can get involved early generate strong returns while also having um, very positive impact. So I'm, I'm excited about the disruption and opportunity that's gonna occur because of this push to net zero. Yeah, awesome. I, you know, um, that's pretty amazing that we're at 88 and 90% uh, committed to net zero and you know, kind of probably a higher number than most of us think of on the top of our head. Uh, but like you said, the promise is, is not the same as action, but uh, hopefully they'll align. So last but not least, um, Certainly not least, let's uh, hear from Dr. Hall. Hey, great, thank you. Um, Bruce Hall, uh, so I, I, uh, I work on systems change, particularly you know, really wicked problems like climate change um, and work with people that are trying to collaborate in the cross-sector space where business and investment and government and civil society sort of intersect. Um, so it's a fascinating 
uh, set of challenges that we face. Climate's not the only one, but it's one of the larger ones. Um, and uh, just uh, fascinating working with, with folks like we have on the call here today. Um, what's uh, one of the things that sticks with me about two, 2021? Uh, I have to, a uh, bit of the wet blanket, I guess it's COVID, right? The pandemic, uh, we, we got to mention it. Um, the, uh, uh, it concerns me uh, because of the, the loss of economic growth is making more people vulnerable to climate change. It's already happening. So I think that's having, having a huge impact. Uh, the, the various stimulus packages around the world have put a lot of money into climate, which is good, but it's also overextended uh, some, uh, some government budgets. And so that, that's problematic. Um, and then it's uh, COVID has also taught us uh, that uh, we're not very rational when it comes to making decisions. It's hard to make collective policies. Uh, you know, the politics and tribalism certainly trump the rational science perspective. Um, so uh, we've learned a lot from COVID that I think translates into, into, into climate. So that's, that's uh, some, some thoughts. And yeah, no, thanks. I think that's an interesting point to think about, you know, that, that COVID is almost like a microcosm of climate science, right? You know, we've, a lot of this data has been out there for a really long time and it's been taking a long time to become mainstream and, you know, COVID showed that science doesn't always listen, even in a pandemic, matter in a pandemic, but I digress. And that could be a whole nother panel. So um, <clears throat> just before we get started and dive into some of our, you know, uh, topics that we want to cover, uh, if anyone has any questions, just please don't hesitate to enter them in the chat. And feel free to introduce yourselves and share any relevant insights. If something comes up in the chat that that you know sounds like it could help the discussion, I'll be sure to put it out there. Um, we'll also try and leave some time at the end to answer questions, but I, I can't make any promises. So I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. So without further ado, um, let's get started. So Chris, let's start with you. Um, can you name one or two areas where investors are making the most commitments to impact and see the greatest opportunities in 2022? Sure. So there's a couple of different, I guess, themes that I will cover. The first sure. is um, there's increased interest and investment in specialists. And I'm, I'm referring to investment managers now, as, a, as I mentioned, we're an allocator in the managers of different sorts. So by specialists, I mean, for example, managers that are experts in understanding the energy transition or resource efficiency. These are managers that have backgrounds in industry. So in the, some of the industries that they're actually investing into, they may have backgrounds in uh, public policy, which is obviously critical to the energy transition. They have backgrounds in science and some of the um, material science and other areas that are critical to transition. And of course, in investing. And the same goes for the water space, which is also of course critical as it relates to climate change. So across asset classes, there are a number of emerging specialists in energy transition, in water, and other climate-related uh, verticals where we're seeing capital flow to. The second thing I'll bring up, it's not really in a specific area, but it's this concept of custom impact investments. So some folks are very concerned about climate. Some folks are very concerned about education, about um, microfinance, about healthcare, all of which have a, have a link to climate. But the, the idea is that uh, investors want to invest in areas that align with the missions of their organizations or their families. And so there's a lot more customization happening in impact. And as Julia and Kyle mentioned, there's more and more managers that have emerged in, in lots of different areas that can kind of meet that demand. That's interesting. You know. Um... Is, is, is that custom impact space something that you see, um, you know, what, what kind of growth do you see happening in that space? You know, just kind of general, if you had to, you know, put a, a figure on it. I don't know if I can put a figure on it, but I can tell you that it comes up more and more in the RFPs that we receive. It, organizations that care about impact, they want to align it with their mission. And frankly, not everyone, most people don't know how to do that yet. And so they're kind of leaning on their, OCIOs or consultants to kind of help them start to execute on that. So it's pretty early. Julia, that sounds like a lot of people who might need Invest's help in building their impact uh, strategy. So um, I'll actually just pass that kind of same question on to you. You know, um, yeah. what areas are you seeing in 2022? Well, one that I have been seeing that is kind of ex exciting and I think different and may also be the result of COVID is more uh, sustainable food systems investing. Uh, 
it, COVID caused a lot of supply chain disruptions that, like Bruce was saying, have you know created these sort of micro needs for changes in policy, et cetera. Uh, I think Qatar, for example, couldn't import certain types of vegetables for months. Like a lot of people are realizing they need their own resilient local food systems. Um, so we saw just this year generate, a, and this is sort of in the food system uh, uh, recycling as well, generate uh, acquired Atlas Organics and is invested on composting facilities. Uh, General Atlantic, which you don't think of is traditionally an effective investor, has started a net zero fund and invested in recycling and vertical farming and the ticket sizes of 80 to 100 million. Um, and, we, and of course, we've mentioned this in our in our newsletter in the in December, but you know, sustainable ag is really critical as we move forward towards climate solutions with 90% of soil at risk of degradation and land use and agriculture causing about 30%, depending on uh, exactly how you measure of GHG emissions worldwide. Um, another commitment that I think ties into not necessarily the big cash opportunity in, in the business, but is coming up a lot is on the measurement side. So uh, companies or, or tools that are helping ESG investors move from risk assessment only to truly other ways of managing um, outcome-based sustainable uh, uh, opportunities are getting attention. For example, 60 Decibels, which is a spinoff of Acumen Fund, is a measurement company that is much more on the impact measurement than let's say ESG. They survey people on the ground, they travel around the world. Uh, they received a $6 million investment this week. So we're seeing more activity in that sort of measurement space that is also bringing more validity and sort of uh, unifying a lot of different metric systems that is still a big cause of concern for, for impact investors. Yeah, and you know, just to kind of prod a little more, you talked about some of the larger asset managers, both you guys getting involved in the space. And one of the things that, that came across my radar that I thought was interesting was BlackRock opening a circular economy fund, um, which was much more targeted than most of their kind of ESG funds, which talking about how 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 sustainable they are is a whole nother conversation. But you know, to have that targeted circular economy fund with a $10 million minimum investment. That to me, you know, is is looking a little bit more, you know, kind of towards that thematic investing side. So, you know, is that a trend you think might continue? Is it good to see? You know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, personally, yeah, I think I think it's a good thing uh, that we have more and more professional investors of all kinds entering the space. And while they might not be perfect at it at the beginning, uh, you know, we're we're talking about transitioning as well from the way people used to do things to a whole new way of doing business. For us that do impact investing, we understand a lot of these things already. But for someone that's traditionally a finance investor to really understand, they need to start researching in the science, understanding the metrics that need to be used. So there's a certain uh, shift that needs to happen before we get to very deep impact at the level that perhaps the Black Rocks are in. But that's a huge, and, 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 and it indicates to the entire financial market when those big players move into the space that, that the time has come for everybody to shift. So I think that it, there is an importance to that. And some investors only do funds that are that size, right? There's sort of a mm -hmm. threshold that they won't invest under. So also, you know, that's really important. We're excluding a huge amount of investors because we don't have vehicles for them, including, you know, pension funds, insurance, pre insurance investors, et cetera, they're writing. Hundred, two hundred million dollar tickets at a time. Cool, thank you. You know, I, yeah, you're definitely right. I, I, I would love to invest in a circular economy fund. Unfortunately, I'm just about nine hundred ninety nine thousand dollars short of the the nine hundred nine million nine hundred ninety nine thousand dollars short of the minimum. But maybe I'll get there. Uh, sure. Bruce, so bringing you into this, you, you heard a little bit about kind of where the investment professionals see opportunity. How does that align for you with the science? Uh, you know, what what is your view of the most pressing needs? Yeah, well, uh, fortunately, there are many of them, right? So there's a lot of opportunities here. It's talking about uh, large scale systems change, um, and uh, let me just break it down into into three pieces. Uh, again, I want to provide the sort of the systems perspective. Uh, there's adaptive responses, um, so adaptation to climate change. There's mitigation to prevent it from happening, and then there's sort of the moral side of it, the justice side of it. Um, and and I'll, I'll touch on the first two here and then maybe get to justice when we get to another question. But adaptation is such a huge, and it's an underinvested um, and underattended uh, challenge. So uh, 
it's our, I think it's possible to argue, and hopefully I'll have time to argue this later, that we're going to blow past 1.5 degrees if we'd be lucky if we stop at three. And that's going to increase, uh, just, it's going to disrupt all sectors, uh, food, healthcare, infrastructure, and on and on. Let's just take infrastructure as an example, the buildings, the grid, the, 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 the water systems, the, the subway stations, the, the roads, and what have you. Um, there are basically three adaptive responses. You can um, you can defend. You can put up a seawall or a dike or something. You can you can harden the target. That is, you can raise the uh, the the entrances to the subway stations or the roads, or you can you can raise things so they don't don't get flooded out. Or you can retreat. You can move. And if, if we look at um, uh, what that means, is is um, uh, places like Florida that flood a lot, you know, you can see examples of it in, in, um, uh, in the insurance industry, right? The number of insurance insurers are unwilling to invest and insure a property. Uh, so the state has had to step in and, and uh, the state likely is, is overextended. They, they had to step in to keep development, to keep builders building. Um, and so what is the future of the insurance uh, industry here? Uh, another issue is municipal solvency. Um, the, the retreat means that people are leaving. We're talking about millions of people over the, over the next few decades, tens, maybe more millions of people. Um, and so uh, that has huge impacts on tax base. Um, certainly municipal solvency is gonna be impacted by the investments that are required to uh, restore, fix, uh, harden the, the infrastructure. So there, there's just enormous implications just, to, just in that sector. Um, so adaptation uh, is an underappreciated challenge and opportunity. Um, mitigation uh, is the thing that we're most familiar with, and that's you know, slowing down or kicking out the greenhouse gases that are going into the atmosphere um, that are causing the problem. And you know, we're, we're very familiar with energy opportunities. We've talked about that. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, the, one of the bigger and underappreciated challenges there is, is the grid and transmission. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, we mentioned, I guess, buildings. Um, we, we, some of the folks have already mentioned that. Uh, arguably, buildings are about 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and uh, just, just a, an example within that sector, air conditioning is, is going to uh, are likely uh, increase by magnitudes of order over the next, next couple of decades. Uh, and so fortunately, green building technology is, is amazing. Um, so you know, energy systems gonna transform, buildings gonna transform. Um, and then just one more, uh, the materials, uh, the cement and steel each are what, 7% or so of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we are uh, in the venture stage, we're in the uncertain stage of how to transform materials, uh, but, but uh, there's gonna be a lot of opportunity there, a lot of risk, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but the steel and cement industries have to transform tremendously. So there, just, just um, a little bit of adaptation, think about uh, the opportunities there, mitigation, there, there are tons of opportunities there. Uh, and then uh, maybe when we get later in the, in the seminar, later, later in the session, we'll talk about justice issues uh, because not all the opportunities and burdens are equally distributed. No, no, we'll definitely come back to justice. But, you know, now having heard kind of a little bit of the investment side and the science side, I think, you know, Kyle, that's where we come to you because venture capital has a very special role to play in this, right? Um, it's sure. different than the kind of what what impact investors are doing, what Chris is doing. Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit more from you about, you know, where you think we need the money to go and, and where you're seeing opportunity in the space. For sure. I, I think it's super interesting. And you guys touched on kind of that, yeah, like you mentioned, kind of both what I, what I would say lenses or ways that we can really look at, um, you know, look at the problem. I think there's the, the science lens, uh, or the academic lens, and then you're sort of ranking, um, you know, which, which areas contribute the largest percentage of greenhouse gas emissions. And then you try to kind of, you know, maybe rank those and then try to tack those problems in order of which ones are, are you know, would have the biggest impact to focus on the top the top of your list. And so then you're getting to things, you know, like Bruce mentioned, you know, green steel and, and heavy industry and manufacturing, um, you know, the built environment, um, you know, and different things around, you know, buildings and concrete and the energy to produce all of that. And that, that would be the kind of science lens um, of kind of taking that, 
that you know way of kind of force ranking. And then the other lens is you know the VC lens, I guess the way I look at it, um, which is just one you know, small sliver in the overall you know, financial stack of, you know, ways to actually fund these problems. So I'm not talking about things like, you know, government R&D spending and infrastructure finance spending and, you know, other non-dilutive grants and, and things like that, um, that can also be applied to this in different ways. But from a VC standpoint, I guess the way we tend to look at it or should be looking at it right on behalf of our, our LPs is, you know, business viability mixed with financial return um, and then measuring hopefully on the impact side as well to make sure that you're you're kind of touching on, you know, somewhere in the higher side of that list, you know, on the science side and really trying to find that Venn diagram. And so, you know, I think because of that, we've seen, you know, two thirds of funding on the VC side go toward mobility and, you know, mobility infrastructure and, you know, battery storage around that and, and everything around mobility because, um, you know, we can point to companies um, and we can point to a demand market, you know, so we can point to Tesla, we can point to, you know, also traditional finance, I'm uh, sorry, traditional, um, you know, automotives that are now making the transition. And we can see that there's consumer demand on that side of things. And so from an early stage venture standpoint, we can point to that from a viability standpoint and understand their scale and by investing in that market. And I think that's why a lot of people have started there from a climate tech investment standpoint. Secondarily, but although I think there's going to be some interesting um, plays now, especially to be made around around food and ag, you know, Julia mentioned, you know, food systems are extremely important on, you know, the science lens, but I think from a venture standpoint, there's going to be a massive amount of opportunity there. Again, there's, you know, we can look at it on the consumer side, the plant-based food, uh, you know, meats and dairies and alternative meat um, companies that we can now point to beyond meat and we can point to impossible foods and, you know, we can point to companies that have found scale um, from, a, from a financial standpoint, but also we realize there's consumer demand there and we can realize there can be a business that can be financially viable. Um, so I think that, you know, venture being a small piece of the pie is kind of looking at it from a diff couple different lenses. Um, in addition to, you know, mobility, food, I think like you meant, like you, uh, Julie also mentioned, there's some spaces around um, both reporting, um, you know, carbon accounting software is becoming really interesting and other ways of using software and frontier technologies to do things around measurement and tracking um, of the built environment or the physical environment. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of companies that are leveraging micro satellites to do a lot of surveying of land, um, you know, on the food and ag side and, um, and you know, land, water, air management side. Um, even on the flood side, you know, Bruce mentioned a lot of the flooding that's going to be happening. There is definitely some companies at the earlier stage that I've been looking at that have, you know, found better ways to kind of do real time uh, flood maps and really try to help to give a better story of what that might look like. Um, as more areas that weren't traditionally flooding are starting to flood. Um, and also obviously from a venture standpoint, again, we can start to say, okay, flood mapping and better data around that, we can start to sell into insurance companies and give them better um, you know, views on how to actually price a lot of that from, from a financial standpoint. So I think um, you know, there's two lenses that we can look at it and from a venture lens, um, you know, that's kind of how, um, how I've been looking at it, where I think the opportunity is. Wow. No, thank you. That, that, I mean, that, that's, that's a lot of opportunity, clearly. Um, I wish I had any money to, to, you know, be involved in that, but that, that is, uh, it's exciting. It really is. So I, thank you guys all for the, the insights there. I mean, I'm sure we could actually talk about this for three or four hours, but uh, in the interest of the human construct of time, we'll move on <laughs> because uh, I'd like to talk to you guys a little bit about, uh, about COP26 or COP26, uh, where there were significant, you know, conversations about sustainable finance, it, it really kind of jumped to the forefront of the coverage of the event this year. Um, so let's talk about that in, in a couple of subsections. I think for one, we'll talk about the financing needed, right? You know, BCG estimated in 2020 that capital markets can achieve, can achieve between three to five million trillion per year of financing, um, and that's what's going to be needed annually by 2050 to keep us under 1.5 degrees of warming. Uh, the Climate Policy Initiative has that number much more specifically at 4.35 trillion annually by 2030. Right, given early estimates place climate financing at roughly 800 billion for 2021, we're talking about a 450% increase in just nine years or eight years. So first, before we even talk about getting there, I'd like to ask Bruce if you think it's possible for us to reach those numbers in time to mitigate warming below 1.5 degrees. You already said, you know, we're racing towards three degrees. So 
you know, if we can raise $4 trillion a year, can we achieve this? Yeah, I already showed my hand, didn't I? Uh, so <laughs> the short answer is, is no. Uh, I hate to keep being the wet blanket here. Uh, it doesn't mean the world's going to end, right? It just means actually that there are more challenges and opportunities for investment. Uh, things get a little bit more expensive, a little bit more disrupted. But yeah, we're going to blow by 1.5, probably end up around three. And of course, I'm speculating. I don't have any better crystal ball than anybody else. But uh, let me just summarize it in 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 one one way. The 80 percent is a number to think about. 80 percent. Um, it's it's a carbon budget. We if we've got we've got so much that we can. There's only so much. Think of a balloon and and it's it's filled to bursting. That's how much greenhouse gases we can emit into the into the atmosphere before we blow by two degrees. And and we've already emitted eighty percent of that. Uh, we've already committed to emitting eighty percent of that. Uh, it's already in our the gas tanks. It's already in the the the, uh, the cars. It's already in the in the buildings. It's already in the the infrastructure. We've already and we haven't paid for it yet. So it's going to be really hard not uh, to 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 use all that infrastructure that we that we're paying for now and turn it off and switch to something else. So that that's it's we, we're committed to burning about eighty percent already. And there's still a lot of demand coming online from from developing world. So the other side of the 80% is in order to meet that carbon budget, in order to keep that balloon from exploding, uh, we have to leave about 80% of the, of the fossil fuels in the ground. We, that, and there's a, that's, a, that's a really big challenge because that's a lot of money that we're leaving, not on the table, but in the ground. Uh, and the enticement to uh, pull that out and, and use it uh, and the balance sheets of uh, trouble that we get into if we, if, if we don't. Uh, pull it out if we don't count it uh, is huge. So 80% um, this carbon budget is, is where we don't have a whole lot of wiggle room. So I think we're on our way to 3%, three degrees thereabouts, which means uh, a lot of change. Things are going to go a little bit more expensive and disrupted uh, and, and investment's going to be even more important. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, I, <laughs> no, I mean, listen, I, I think, I think a dose of reality is good for everybody, you know, and to hear a kind of scientific take on it is important. Um, but like you said, it, even to do any kind of mitigation, we're, we're going to need a lot of money. And so, you know, I think next I, I'd want to hear Kyle's thoughts on, you know, well, how can, how can the most money be, be achieved, right? How can, how can the most optimistic scenario of $5 trillion, how can we achieve that? Um, you, you know, what role can, can, can investors play, whether it be from the VC angle or, you know, individual investing a little bit of your thoughts on, on how we can do that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Bruce is, gives a great point. Um, and I think a lot of venture investors, um, you know, fight with that, whether or not to really focus on the mitigation or just start investing in adaptation at this point in terms of where the opportunity might be. But ultimately, I think, you know, barring, you know, and, and given the fact that obviously government has to play a role in a lot of this to, you know, create, um, you know, a regulatory environment to allow for, um, you know, and or, uh, to allow for and or, you know, force some of these changes that we need to see um, to happen and ultimately really create financial incentives uh, for better, for worse, for people to actually start making those changes. You know, we have our small, small microcosm of people, you know, especially on this call and, and those that are really focused on climate that are values aligned and want to really see this um, as something from an impact standpoint. But I think to get the larger five trillion, the bigger number, you know, we really start, start starting to need to show the opportunity and starting to show, you know, the financial incentive for how um, really there's going to be a lot of opportunity, like you guys just mentioned, um, to focus on this space. I mean, Larry Fink in his closing letter of last year just said there's going to be a thousand unicorns that are going to be coming out of climate. It's not going to be the next social, you know, search engine. It's not going to be the next social media app or the next kind of filter on top of the filter, then take the photo and the, 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 the it's going to be in climate um, where we're going to see a lot of this, these massive opportunities. And so I think sh talking about that and telling the story around that, um, and again, having proof points to point to for successes um, is extremely important to get people rallied around um, the opportunity. You know, another point I'll mention specific into the VC space, you know, Fred Wilson was making his predictions, I think it was last year, maybe two years ago. Um, he thought, you know, climate's going to be this generation, what cloud was to the last generation. And so 
you know, again, showing that there's a massive opportunity to be had there if you look at cloud as a proxy. Um, and obviously Union Square Ventures is where, where Fred's from. Union Square Ventures recently created a $130, $134 million, you know, climate specific fund in order to, you know, both be part of the change that they want to see, but obviously see the opportunity for their investor base. And so I think, you know, that's really, you know, where I think investors, where we need to kind of galvanize investors around this. Great. Um, Chris, Julia, do you have anything you'd like to add on, on kind of where we can get this money from? Sure. I think, um, and I'm not just saying because Kyle's on the panel, but I think Kyle's on the right track. I, I think the one thing that we all can do here as institutions or as individual investors is invest in early stage venture. So um, I think that's where we get both potentially the best financial returns and also the best impact multipliers. If these, um, if we can finance startup companies that are disrupting and creating real solutions to these problems, if you just look, take a look at Bill Gates's Breakthrough Energy Ventures Fund, that's what that's the approach that he's taking, and he's taking a lot of different approaches, but that's one of them. And um, there's a lot of different examples of, of technologies that could be game changers. I'll just rattle off a few. Zero carbon cement. So Bruce mentioned the cement industry and how important it is. Uh, there are technologies being developed to make cement production actually zero carbon. Uh, replacements for plastics. I know Kyle can speak to that, tech, those types of technologies. Plastics obviously, obviously being made out of fossil fuels. Yeah. I think fusion is a really important, I think fusion is really important in our future. I think uh, people, I think it's closer to being viable than a lot of people might think. And uh, Kyle mentioned alternative meats, that's critical. Getting lithium in different ways, lithium being required for lithium ion batteries, there's different approaches to that, like taking it from saltwater deposits instead of um, mines. All of this is early stage technology that requires financing and that if it breaks through, will have a very strong uh, impact multiplier and financial returns. So that's one area I think that we all can actually make, make a difference. And I think I'll add on to that quickly is that I agree with Chris, you know, looking at some of the data as well around where climate financing has gone. And Julia mentioned some of the larger institutions to General, General Atlantic and the TPGs and the Blackstones uh, or Black Rocks and Blackstone actually probably, uh, Brookfield and others who've, who've kind of announced multi-billion dollar funds specifically focused on climate. You know, I think that's really um, re you know, reassuring for the early stage investors to know that there's downstream capital. So again, to get that multiplier and that financial return, you know that there's capital to help those companies scale once they get there. And, uh, and the data really shows that there's, there's still kind of a, an opportunity at the earlier stage and, and still hasn't been enough investing at the earlier stage to provide that. So I think you know, that balance is gonna start to really, you know, um, you know, way out and provide opportunities for, obviously I'm talking my own book because I'm an early stage venture fund, but, uh, but I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities at the earlier stage, like Chris mentioned, for us to take advantage and, and really have the impact we wanna see. Yeah, no, I, I think that, oh, sorry, Jules. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was just gonna say that I 100% agree that the early stage has sort of the most exciting frontier investment opportunities. However, to complement and just sort of, uh, remind that like that we still need the capital invested in the other areas in a sort of systemic asset allocation approach right so definitely we need the venture we also need the sustainable agriculture less less um high yielding renewable assets you know the we need the infrastructure investors etc so a lot of that requires patient capital too and i think some of those managers that that we've mentioned like breakthrough has a long time horizon uh, but a lot of these funds need to have the the patience and the uh, the value chain to be supporting entrepreneurs from the very early stage, high capital intensive in investments, like Bruce said, to innovate cement or other things like that, that may require some blended finance as well, where we're seeing either a government step in and provide some uh, risk-free capital, or you have a philanthropy come in and provide either a subsidized loan or lower, you know, so, so de-risking capital to the investment. So we need all hands on deck. I think uh, the urgency, as Bruce mentioned, is also uh, a, an issue, right? Like we're not approaching it as if we have to do all of this today, uh, the way we have addressed COVID, for example. So I think taking that approach of how do we integrate the urgency that we applied to addressing COVID to climate change and, and not stop sort of pushing it down the line to five years from now. Great. That's, um... 
you know, I, I think it's, it's very interesting to talk about early stage investing. And I, I think, you know, it's something to think about because also, you know, how do you balance that with, and this is something we could talk about another time, obviously it's, it's, it'll take a long time to think about, but you know, for, for some investors, they don't have the risk tolerance to, to do early stage investing. So, you know, it's kind of balancing those strategies. So that actually takes me to the next topic, which is, um, Andrew, can I just say something? Yeah, sure, Bruce, go ahead. I think, you know, I, I, um, it's easy to interpret what I have to say as being pessimistic. I'm not. I'm actually pretty optimistic about the, that, that we'll be able to uh, transform the system. Um, and there's just so much evidence, as we're seeing here. Uh, it's just that it, it's going to be slow. It's going to be difficult. It's going, it's going, to, it's going to take a lot of different ways. Um, and the investment community is going to be key, not just in where and how they invest, but also uh, let me just recommend that you think about having leveraging investment to uh, help business uh, influence government policy. Uh, there's a there's a tremendous opportunity here. We're not going to solve this without some uh, significant government policy changes, and uh, we need to leverage business, the business voice, uh, to through investments to to influence that that policy. So we have, I think we we're going to have to move into an active, more of an activist role uh, as investors and 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 business to influence government policy. So I, I just wanted to make that point. I, the the solutions are out there. Uh, and investment's got a big role to play, uh, but we, it's all hands on deck. Uh, and, and so we need to figure out somehow a way to influence uh, government policy as well. Well, that, then it is promising, like we mentioned in the beginning, to see you know every year a new level of shareholder activism on these topics. So um, hopefully that continues in the future. But uh, I wanted to bring this in, you know, we were going to talk a little bit more here about um, adaptation and mitigation, but I think I'll, I'll move that to just kind of get to Thoughts from Chris and Julia, maybe Chris first on, on how do portfolio investors approach net zero investing, right? Um, obviously, we're talking about the, the the urgency of this type of investing. So, so how does a portfolio investor approach it? Not, you know, we start. Sure. So there's a few different approaches. One we've, I mean, we've touched on a lot of them, um, but the first is investing in um, new technologies. And products and services that reduce emissions anywhere, you know, from renewable, and it doesn't have to be all early stage, as, as uh, we mentioned, you know, it's, it's anywhere from renewables up and down that value chain, not just those making solar panels, but everyone involved in, in that value chain from start to finish. EVs, carbon capture and storage, lots of different opportunities to invest in um, emission reducing and even net negative emission technologies. Bruce mentioned engagement in terms of uh, on, on public policy, and you've mentioned engagement in terms of um, shareholders, that's another big way to, to approach this. So um, the divestment movement from fossil fuels continues. I actually think that's effective as well, but there's also the approach of investing in those businesses and engaging with them and trying to change behavior. And then there's also the growing global markets around carbon credits, regulated carbon credit cap and trade markets in California, Europe, now China, various other countries, and probably growing. And then also the carbon offset market, forestry projects, renewable projects. Um, and so those are lots of different approaches that, that investors can take and really across asset classes as well. Great, Julio, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think Chris touched on a lot of um, the key points, but just to add to that, uh, you know, for those who are sort of starting from a position of not having done any impact investing, you know, recommend that you kind of try and do a forensic analysis of your existing portfolio to establish what carbon footprint it has today. Uh, a lot of investors don't really realize their underlying carbon exposure through their investments. And, and that can be a, 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 something that at least wakes you up to certain patterns, perhaps. Um, and then once you are aware of where that concentration of, of carbon is in the portfolio, whether it's a fund that you're managing or an entire asset allocation as a private wealth advisor, et cetera, you can start to um, track, you know, uh, represent where the carbon carbon footprint is across the different types of emissions, right? Scope one, scope two, and scope three, which are direct, indirect energy production and, and other aspects of the, of the supply chain there. And you can create a strategy, a long-term strategy to either divest from certain aspects of that model, right? Like Chris was saying, divest from fossil fuels or uh, divest from companies that don't have an, an environmental policy on the ESG side. You can also uh, in, invest in corporates that are, let's say, 
committed and have actually started moving assets into uh, into reducing scope one, two, and three emissions. For example, I was just speaking with an analyst at General Motors who was saying that they're really focused on scope two emissions now. How do they reduce uh, the uh, re exposure to extraction and fossil fuels in their energy product energy supply chains? They're not yet fully going electric on the automobiles, but that's kind of the next frontier. Um, also, uh, you're seeing more activist corporate engagement behavior, as, as Chris mentioned. So large blocks of investors actually challenging the board of directors to take an action on the environment. Um, that's sort of a change from the old school activist hedge fund manager to now a climate activist hedge fund manager. And that's exciting. And we'll see more of that in the future, we hope. Cool. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because indirectly you would you know your point also ties into what chris and, and bruce were saying about you know uh government intervention because to get to the transparency in the emissions of your portfolio stronger regulation and, and, and reporting requirements are probably going to be required before we can really understand that um and i know you know gary gensler has been talking about doing it we haven't seen it yet the eu has has, has the new reporting requirements and it'll be interesting to see how those also evolve um to help us better understand what's in our portfolios in terms of our emissions. Um, we're already running a little short on time, so I wanted to shift to a very different topic, which is um, a little bit about, about equity. Um, you know, last year we had a block of emerging market companies, uh, country, companies, countries, um, pushing more strongly than ever on the idea that developed nations like the United States, um, who face the least economic and environmental risks, should be financing global mitigation and adaptation strategies. Uh, developed nations cumulatively, cumulatively have emitted more GHG emissions than emerging markets, of course, but currently emerging markets such as China and India are emitting more than any developed nation except for the United States. So the long and short of that, Bruce, is do you think developed nations will agree with that idea that, you know, an equitable way forward would be for developed nations who already took their share to help developing nations um, move forward? Yeah, and this is one of the big political stumbling blocks for global collaboration, and, and the COP uh, often fails or, or uh, falls on this knife. Uh, so this was the third big uh, way to think about the systems change that's needed. We have to adapt, we have to mitigate, and uh, we have to deal with justice. So just like most uh, things in, in life, uh, uh, the, the benefits and costs are not evenly distributed. Uh, and and it, it turns out that uh, climate is, is no exception. And so the, the, the places that, that have uh, become the wealthiest and the most developed have the most capacity to adapt um, uh, are, are the ones that burn the, the biggest amount of carbon budget. So those people that didn't uh, uh, are also the most vulnerable because it's harder for them to adapt. So this is a really, really difficult challenge. Um, and so, yeah, I do think, uh, well, one way to solve it is, is, is through transfer of funds to help, help uh, vulnerable populations adapt. Um, uh, another way is to uh, transfer technology and funds to help uh, countries that need to pull still billions out of poverty. Uh, another couple of billion out of poverty uh, is, is, is going to come basically through energy. It's going to come through providing clean, uh, renewable energy. And so, how do we how do we help those developing economies uh, pr provide energy? So, this is the moral dimension of investment. Um, it, and and you know, there are lots of opportunities in mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and they're just moral issues that I, uh, you know, I think we keep us up at night if we think about them uh, in terms of, of dealing with the justice and, and the vulnerable issues. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, so thank you. So, so that's interesting because, you know, that's obviously been a challenge. And I think realistically, we'll, we'll probably never see a scenario where developed nations are going to fund all of the things that are needed. So, Julia, you know, you have a lot of experience working with emerging markets and, and developing nations. Um, you know, how do you think ESG or in, impact or thematic investing can help? And, and how would that might that play out in the future? Yes. Um, so we're actually, gonna, I'm going to use the example of Brazil, where we've seen kind of a tremendous shift over the past two years uh, in a country where right now, at least their political leadership is not very uh, proactive on the environment, to say the least. Um, so it, as a reaction, we've had kind of two things driving this ESG and impact movement in Brazil. One is that a lot of asset allocators, not, not a lot, but a, a sizable amount of asset allocators from Europe, pension funds, et cetera, have divested from certain industries in Brazil altogether because of lack of regulation, companies 
um, like that were that are famous in the agriculture space that were not compliant, that were, let's say, deforesting land to raise cattle, et cetera. They re received an aggressive message that they're just not going to get any investment under those conditions. Um, that was one of the triggers. There's also sort of a, a movement of next generation investors. So the the children of the uh, billionaires of Brazil who kind of pushed back on their, and now I'm talking children who are in their 40s and 50s running their own businesses, saying, you know, why are we investing this way? They sort of had their own uh, uh, uprising, particularly in the context of the per current Brazilian, um, you know, a, a lack of action on the Amazon, et cetera. Uh, also, you see banks who are operating uh, either in Europe and in Latin America also as as Bruce kind of alluded, having policies that, that are pushing through impact products to Latin America. You're seeing more and more products uh, providing different, different strategies on asset allocation in the sustainable side. Um, also, you see, as Bruce mentioned, a leapfrogging of technology, a, a tra technology transfer happening that allows, and, and a lot of investment has gone in from developed nations already into say, renewable uh, solar panels, other industries that innovation has now made affordable. Uh, and so you're seeing leapfrogs on, on the technology side in, in certain aspects of this climate transition that I think will allow or at least help Latin America and the emerging markets that are going to be unable to fund this with capital from their, their governments, which is generally politically unpopular as well. So there's a, a movement that does want to fund, but also a lot of, a lot of people who don't think spending uh, outside of the economy and social justice is is the right way to go either. So uh, it makes sense that governments need to balance that with the private sector investment. Great. Um, I think also, Kyle, you have a little bit of kind of more specific example from Indonesia as well that maybe you could share um, to give us an idea as to how this can work. Yeah, I think I think uh, the example I was really going to mention, um, and it kind of speaks to what we've been saying around um, having urgency and how I think urgency is what leads to innovation, um, and and really being butting up against the problem is what and what is what leads to solutions um, at a faster rate. You know, because of COVID, you know, you know all the MNRI technology was was able to to leapfrog and really become possible extremely fast um, at rates people didn't expect. And I think Indonesia. Um, in one way is a cautionary tale of adaptation, but also you can see some opportunity there that we can, can learn from. So, you know, what I was gonna say, Jakarta, you know, they announced that they're gonna be in the process of trying to move their capital, um, you know, a thousand miles east to the, the island of Borneo. Um, and really, you know, why are they moving, why would they move their entire capital, um, you know, over all the way east, you know, and the main reasons are one, air pollution. So Jakarta um, is becoming extremely polluted and is starting to really match or even overtake some of the more notorious cities like Beijing and, and Delhi and places that we see a lot of this air pollution becoming an extreme issue. And the second one is that the city is sinking. And so on an island in a sinking city, um, you know, even though you might have seawalls as one of the solutions that Bruce had mentioned, you know, that's going to become an issue, right, with sea level rise. And so, you know, they're trying to use that as a way to adapt to actually just move. I would think that was the third point that you said, Bruce, on the adaptation side is to just move, pick up and move. And so, um, you know, from that, I think it's a cautionary tale of what might have to happen in some other coastal cities, even the developed world. Um, potentially, if this continues to go that route, um, but also opportunities. So, you know, there are startups that I've been learning from and, and really having conversations with in places like Jakarta that are focused on air quality, um, for example, and are using, um, you know, IoT and other frontier technology to actually track what the air quality is in, in the city. Um, you know, that's also what I'm seeing now being mirrored in the developed world, you know, in places like London, Los Angeles, um, there are startups that are now starting to, you know, use IoT devices to do the same. And so I think innovation that we're learning from the emerging market, we can actually start to apply to the developed market as this becomes really a global issue um, as well. And so that's kind of how, you know, from a venture standpoint, I'm kind of looking at projecting into the future by looking at some of what's happening in the emerging markets and what might, you know, really work in the developed world. Yeah, you know, the, the Indonesia example of Jakarta, you know, since this just is really happening now. Um, it's interesting because we think about it on one hand as being kind of a adaptation tactic, but at the same time, you know, think we, we don't have any idea what the actual downstream impacts are going to be of cutting down 
you know, a couple of thousand acres of rainforest on the island of Borneo, right? What that's going to mean for the orangutan population, for, you know, for, for the air, for, for so many different things, you know, because Borneo is the lungs of Indonesia. And now you're going to kind of cut a big chunk of it out to put a massive city. And, you know, we, we could go down this road for a long time, but, but it just kind of talks about the complexity of these adaptation strategies and how, you know, even when, when there might be a solution that's presented, what are, what does that mean for the planet going forward? Right. Um, we are running short on time. So I just kind of want to just tie this up and maybe, you know, if people want to stay a little bit extra, we can answer some questions, but, um, I think most importantly <laughs> for investors that aren't already invested in, in this, in, in, in this space, what can investors do to shift their assets towards sustainable investing? Um, and I think we'll just go with uh, some thoughts from Julia and then Chris and, and then Kyle and Bruce, you can feel free to chime in if you'd like as well. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so we touched a little bit on the concept that to get started, you really need to know what you have in your portfolio today and, and start thinking about what you what areas you want to prioritize um, while also talking to your investment managers, consultants, and whomever you need to support you on that journey. A lot of investment firms now have access to products in the space and can help advise you. But of course, you still need support from people like Invest, also from researching and understanding some of the themes underlying like we've learned today. Um, but yeah, doing that, that commitment to forensic accounting, taking the, 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 the commitment to define a roadmap like maybe five years out from now where you're gonna start rebalancing your portfolio towards either net zero or even carbon negative with different strategies you can use. Um, and again, trying to think both Definitely, maybe if you've never done venture, you might want to step into it, but also how can you use other asset classes to create certain effects on your on your carbon output? Um, so some of that will look more innovative and sexy, like the emerging technologies we've heard today, and some will be more traditional strategies or even, even what we call ESG thematic or risk management. Um, so definitely that's where I would start uh, and, and certainly happy to ask help with any, any questions or support you guys need on the next steps. I, I would just say, I think what's key for me is just investing in innovation. That, that's a proven um, good strategy if you can do it intelligent over time. So we talked about an early stage venture. It, it's, we're not reinventing the capital markets. We're just investing in different industries. And as Kyle said, these business models have been proven out in many ways. As Julia said, the number of managers popping up in lots of different verticals and developed markets and emerging markets have increased. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity to invest in various different impact verticals and invest in innovation that's going to have very strong financial returns and very good impact as well. Um, I guess I'll just I mean, I, I agree with all of that, you know, we kind of even ended on that, but, but I think um, from an individual standpoint and where you're putting your dollars to work, um, yeah, like all the things that Julie mentioned, Chris mentioned, there are definitely places to put that, you know, if you're, if you're putting sizable, you know, capital to work, but even if you're kind of looking at your own, you know, small, you know, portfolio that you might have or, or personal stream capital, you know, you can look at technology, again, I'll look at, look at technologies, um, that are helping you do a lot of the screening and a lot of the ESG monitoring on your behalf and kind of like almost like wealth front or betterment for, you know, ESG um, or carbon positive companies, you know, for example, like Aspiration Bank or Carbon Collective or Atmos and Ando, these are all fintech companies that are really doing a lot of the screening um, to, to really kind of say, okay, which companies are actually making positive changes in re relation to the things that we care about. And then also helping you even become kind of an activist in your own way and making sure you're able to vote with your dollars um, in those companies. And so I think there's some kind of mobile first kind of FinTech tools that are starting to be coming out from an early stage investor standpoint that are gonna be really interesting to help there too. Great. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know if you guys have, you know, five or 10 more minutes to answer them, or, you know, we could also just kind of follow up via email, uh, however you guys would like to do it. I've got time. I can stay. I got a little bit. All right. Yeah. So we'll, we'll try to get to these in 10 minutes. Bruce, is that okay for you? Okay. So the first question that came in through the chat was, um, what is the appetite and acceptance of crypto cryptocurrencies 
NFTs and and or DAOs in the sustainable investing space. I'm seeing more and more chatter about their role in transitioning to a clean green economy. Um, and I'll actually add my own thoughts to that is that, you know, we remember there was a big kind of hullabaloo over uh, the carbon footprint of Bitcoin mining, you know, just last year. So this is actually a pretty important topic, I think. So um, I'll pass it, uh, uh, you know, whoever wants to start, please, please give your thoughts. Yeah, I, I would say I've been looking at a lot of that, actually, um, kind of the intersection of crypto and climate. Um, I think on the kind of um, like NFT and um, kind of putting like tokenizing things like carbon credits um, to allow for all that to be on chain. And so you can get away from the double counting um, and kind of all that that's happening right now in the marketplace. I think that's super interesting. And then on the DAO side, um, I think that that can be a way to galvanize large amounts of people to pool capital to do things um, that are climate positive. And so I think there, there are a lot of uh, DAOs that are actually um, being spun up actually in the climate space, uh, Klima DAO, um, uh, uh, there's a couple of D-Climate, um, there's a couple interesting companies. Um, also the Open Forest Protocol is another uh, you know, company that's actually um, kind of using crypto um, and tokenizing kind of like forestry. And so um, it can kind of incentivize um, smallholder farmers or, you know, landowners to actually keep um, their forests intact and give them a finan again, a financial incentive to do so. So I think there's a lot of, a lot to be done there. That's, I think that's really exciting outside of obviously the mining side, which is also being solved through kind of some of the green energy solutions and renewable yeah. mining companies and stuff like that, that I've seen. Cool. The only thing I would add is, is and uh, Kyle, you probably know more about it than me, I'm not an expert, but the move in mining from proof of work to proof of stake, I think, helps mm -hmm. reduce the, the footprint as well. Exactly. Great. Okay. Well, I'll move on. Doesn't seem like Julia or Bruce want to jump in here. So, oh, Julia, you got something? Well, Kyle covered most of it. I was just going to say I've seen a couple of these interesting startups, too, on the on the carbon tracking or the carbon uh, offsetting, uh, mm -hmm. offsetting the emissions from the, the actual production of the NFTs and, and crypto. So exciting to at least see that because yeah. I know it's generating a, also a large energy drain at the moment, at least. So we'll see how that how that shifts. But we assume that computing in general is going to get more complex and more energy intensive. So we do need to figure out a strategy there regardless. Nuclear energy, but no, that's beside the point. Uh, this this question, I think, is a little bit more specific uh, to start with Bruce, and it is since surpassing the targets is baked in, uh, the 1.5 target, as I assume what we're referring to, how do you feel about one, carbon removal technology, and two, geoengineering? Wow, this should be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah two, 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 two biggies, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. So that, I mean, that's an important point, Car the uh, sequestration, carbon removal, carbon capture. Um, there really is no way to get to or stay at 1.5 or even two degrees um, without significant amount of sequestration. Without a, uh, even if we 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 are able to green the grid uh, and and um, transition to nuclear power, or whatever it is, you know, we're we're not going to do we're not going to get to even two degrees uh, without a lot of carbon removal. So there's certainly a lot of opportunity there. There's a lot of technology that's coming online. And I always, I, to me, that's the big wild card. That's, that's, a, that's a really huge opportunity. Uh, I really think to make it work though, it's gonna require some policy, we're gonna have to price carbon in some way. Um, uh, and then geoengineering, uh, man, uh, talk about a political hot potato. Uh, we're talking about uh, shooting sulfur in the, in the sky or somehow blocking solar rays, doing some major tweaking of, of, the, of the climate system. Um, big risks, uh, big rewards. Uh, I, the biggest risk is the, uh, if some country acts unilaterally. Uh, because it's going to change the weather in another country. And that arguably is a big political challenge. So I, I, I think actually geoengineering is probably one of the bigger political challenges we face mm -hmm. coming over the next uh, next couple of decades, because somebody may act. It's interesting because it feels like one of those things that might become a topic at a future, you know, future meeting of nations and a future, uh, future COP. Um, There's already a lot of talk about it, a lot of concern just be because of the, the politics of changing the monsoon somewhere. Right. I think there's a cool book called "The Ministry uh, for the Future." Um, great. Yeah, that, yeah, that kind of kind of goes into that as well. How, like you mentioned, Bruce, one of the countries just decided to act, and uh, kind of what happened because of that. But an interesting story. I think we'd probably prefer the geo geoengineering to the children of Kali for now. You know, exactly. If, right. That seems exactly. preferable. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, there's a couple of, of links here that, that you might want to click in in the chat for, you know, just kind of some further reading. And then there was um, a good point was brought up in the chat and we can talk about that briefly. And this was from Will Hogan, um, you know, taking it a step further that you could argue developed nations ought to compensate less developed nations for conservation of, of ecosystems, service supplies, such as Amazonian rainforest. And, um, you know, of course, that was talked about a little bit by Jules when she, Julia when she was talking about Brazil, but, you know, um, it's a very interesting point, right? Because when you think about the continuing um, deforestation of the Amazon, for one example, most of that those goods are, are not staying in Brazil. You know, the meat's being exported to developed nations like China and the United States. Um, there was an article, an expose in, in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago about how much of the leather and the SUVs comes from cattle that is being raised on illegally deforested land in Brazil and, and how complex the system is and how easy it is to, to get around get around the regulations. So, um, you know, let's just spend a couple minutes talking about that is that even when you have regulation, developing nations are kind of still taking it, developed nations are still taking advantage a little bit of developed nations there. And how do we, how do we do anything about that? Who wants to take it? Any specific <laughs> solutions to that? Um, but I think it touches on one of the, the most important topics of all sustainable and impact investments, which is the pricing of externalities. So if you could somehow price this as an externality, and, I, and that's an enormously complicated um, thing to go politically and in terms of business-wise, but that is the purpose of, of pricing externalities. And one of the key goals of the you know, ESG frameworks that are being developed to standardize the reporting of uh, corporate non-financial ESG information. But I think it might fall into that bucket in terms of the type of solution, specifically how you do it, I'm sure is more complicated than, than, I, than I can solve right now, maybe for, the, for this call, but. Well, to add to that, I think that's a great point, Chris. Um, well, we, we, talk, we talked a little bit about investors from developed nations threatening to divest from these companies and pushing that as a form of shareholder activism, which we, is definitely effective in having a tremendous response in countries like Latam, like Brazil. And uh, But on that specific question of like, can arguably developed nations compensate less developed nations for conservation? Uh, my mom, who happens to be on the call, worked for the State Department on uh, the environment in Brazil for a decade. And so she herself was involved in incentivizing the Brazilian government and the, the, the economy in the Amazon towards sustainability, even in the 90s and what we'd call like development finance like or you know policy based pre impact investing. So there is efforts to that. It's hard. And in fact, on another call, we can have my mom talk about some of the political challenges as well, because not everyone likes the Americans coming in and telling uh, other, you know, how you manage your assets and the Amazon is technically inside Brazil, not, a, 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 you know, it's not a supernational property that belongs to everyone. So there are political challenges there as well. But um, anyway, shout out to my mom. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Oh, hi. <laughs> That's like a topic for maybe March. We'll, we'll have a little exactly. March session on the for developed nations, most developing nations conundrum. Um, Okay, Bruce, any thoughts on that? Well, uh, just uh, I'll iterate a point I made earlier about uh, the need to affect policy. Um, I mean, a lot of these challenges, the externalities uh, require some sort of uh, uh, government policy uh, to, to uh, uh, basically enforce standards that are developed voluntarily by the companies. Uh, we've got to we've got to enforce uh, and and uh, and punish bad actors so that the the, the companies that are willing to do it right uh, are rewarded for doing it right. And that that requires policy, uh, and and working across these national lines requires uh, some sort of international policies, which are that's the biggest toughest nut to crack. So there's a there's an important role for invest through investment to influence government to influence policy um, by having businesses do uh, some activist lobbying. Yeah, that really does tie into the point you were making before. So we have one more question. It's a quick one, and then we'll be, we'll be finished. And you guys, just thank you so much for your time. And I know we went a little bit over, but one more question, and that is, um, I think, an, an important one. Um, you know, how can the, investments op the investment options we're talking about today, how can they be marketed more 
to reach a broader part of the population, right? Because, you know, when you talk about greenwashing, a lot of things you talk about are, are, are kind of individual investors who want to make a difference and just kind of buy a fund labeled ESG without really being able to educate themselves fully on what's in it. You know, sometimes you have funds that are labeled fossil fuel free that have 17 energy companies in their holdings. You know, the examples are, are limitless. But, you know, how do we market these really, really kind of pure, you know, the, the, the pure of heart options? How do we market them to a broader audience? So I'll say a couple of things. First, as ESG data measurement becomes better, then uh, we'll be able to distinguish between products that are pure, products that are, are greenwashing, and everything in between. That's, mm -hmm. And so that we're, we're on that road, us as, a, you know, as, a, as an industry, an investment industry, uh, a lot of work to do there. And the second thing I will just say, I and mean, it doesn't help with the broader kind of retail investor base, but greenwashing is real. Um, I would say talk to consultants, wherever else you might be in contact with when, as you're doing your investments, because pattern recognition is very important. So there, there are hundreds and now thousands of ESG funds, knowing which ones are, are real from those which are not requires, you know, meeting with dozens, hundreds of them over time. So I would find, you know, experts who, who have done that work. Yeah, um, you know, just one more thing to add to that, and and thank you, Chris, for your comment. Is you know, for the for those who are just going online and searching the information, you know, just make sure you go into and and understand the holdings of each ETF or you know fund manager that you're looking at. Try to compare them to the applicable benchmarks and and try to understand the best you can. But of course, we're also available to support you along that journey at Invest. We can also, everyone here on this panel is, is an expert and, and hopefully you'll reach out where, where appropriate. So thank you guys. Anyone else want to add anything to that? Good. All right, then let's wrap it up. Thank you guys so much for coming. Andrew, thanks for hosting. What an amazing panel. Uh, we'll recorded this, so we'll be sharing it on YouTube and share it with your community if you thought it was valuable. Thank Have a good one. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, Let's plan it together. <laughs> no pressure, guys. Bye. Right, Thank you. Thank you, guys. You guys are amazing. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.